Um, should we encourage people by introducing ourselves and where we're calling from? Um, I'm Ola, I'm Hi. calling from London. Um, I'll go. I'm Lily, I'm calling from Seattle. I'm Frank, I'm calling from LA. Alex. I'm Alex, I'm in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just setting up the live stream, so I'm... <laughs> oh, you're in Toronto, cool. There are all four different cities. Um. <laughs> three. I um I ought to go grab my Canadian ten dollar to show you my uh, great uncle really quick. Hold on. <laughs> okay. We have three people from New York, one from LA, one from London. Yeah, I'll find it later. <laughs> but this is an international call <laughs> across at least three time zones yes and three countries yeah, and two amazing. continents <laughs> <laughs> what time is it in London uh, 10 p.m. Oh, oh bless you. Thank you. <laughs> well, this is what you get for working for a Canadian website. <laughs> um, we have people watching. Is, is it we streaming on YouTube yet, Alex? Yeah, it is on YouTube. Cool. Ah, hi, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying um, to... Yeah. Uh, on YouTube, Birdie says, loved you in certain women, Lily. Oh, thank you. Alex, are we all pecked up? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to see if I can make the YouTube stream slightly better. Sorry, just give me one second. Um, Cause is anybody here? Are you guys seeing like all four of us by default? Or are you seeing like the person talking? Um, I have the YouTube up and I can see all four of us yeah. at once. Cool. All right. Oh, one second. Mm-hmm. All right. So, um, I guess we can start. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, welcome to Lockdown Film School. Um, this is Seventh Row's weekly dis discussion series with um, filmmakers in various fields. Um, this is our ninth session, I believe. Ninth, yeah. Um, and we're going to keep running these uh, Lockdown Film School sessions um, until, uh, until the end of August. Um, you can catch up with past sessions on our YouTube channel, Seventh Row, or you can actually just go to lockdownfilmschool.com and there's links to all of the previous episodes there. So today we're excited because this is our first um, session where, where we're actually getting to talk with, uh, with actors. Um, and we have two really talented actors with us today, um, Lily Gladstone and Frank Mosley. So um, Lily has- <laughs> Come on, Frank. No, hey, go the other way. There you go. go. You're on my left. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, Lily has been acting on stage uh, since she was a child in Seattle. Um, she was raised on the Blackfeet Reservation in Northwestern Montana until she was 11 before moving to the Seattle suburbs. Um, she's tribal affiliations, which include, oh no, I'm gonna, I should have okay. asked you um, before. I can, Maybe you can say them so I don't stumble. Uh, uh, Kaina, I'm Skapi Pikani, and Nimipu. Thank you. So uh, yeah, Kaina is, a, Kaina is Canada. Um, I'm Scott Pekunis, Montana, Nimapoos, Idaho, or oh. Nez Perce, as some people know. Um, so after graduating from the University of Montana with a BFA in acting, um, she's worked in film and theater across the country, including at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Um, her breakout role was as the rancher in Certain Women, uh, for which she won the LA Film Critics Association and Boss City 
whoops, Boston Society <laughs> of Film Critics Award um, for Best Supporting Actress. Um, she's also nominated for the Independent Spirit Award for Best Supporting Actress and the Gotham Independent Film Award for a Breakthrough Actor. Um, since then, Lily has appeared in Buster's Malheart, Walking Out, Freeland, and First Cow, among others. Um, so yeah, thanks for being here today, Lily. Um, Thank you for having me. And also Orla interviewed Lily for our ebook on First Cow, which is coming out next week. Um, and so you can actually read that interview online and get the book at reichartbook.com. Um, so um, Frank is based in California. Um, it, he's an actor and filmmaker from Texas. He's an alumnus of the 2015 Berlin L Talents, a fellow of the 2017 NYFF Art Artist Academy and a graduate of Black Factory Cinema's 2016 workshop for auteurs led by the late Abbas Kiristami in San Antonio de los Banos in Cuba. Um, he's appeared in Shane Carruth's Upst Upstream Color, Aaron Schoenberg's Chain for Life, Dustin Guy Def Defa's Person to Person, and Jim Cummings' Thunder Road. As a director, his films and video installations have been exhibited around the world, including at Slamdance Film Festival, the Champs-Élysées Film Festival, Dallas Museum of Art and Anthology Film Archives. In the summer of 2018, the Spectacle, Spectacle Theater in Brooklyn, New York City presented his first retrospective, A Fortnight with Frank Mosley. And so Lily and Frank had, have worked together on two films now, I believe. So they did Freeland, which premiered at South by Southwest earlier this year. And you guys shot another film um, last, last year, you said? Mm -hmm. November. October yeah. and November. Frank came on in November, I think. Yeah, I came on in November. It's called The Boarding House Reach. It's a, and it's a uh, animated time travel Western. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you like Buckaroo Banzai. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is up your alley. That's the case. Yep. So I'm going to turn it over to Orla, who's going to lead our uh, discussion. Um, we're gonna we like facilitate discussion between the two of you for the first about 45 minutes or so. And in the last 15 minutes, we'll take uh, questions from the audience. Cool. Um, and if you wanna submit a question, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's the thing that says Q and A, submit your questions there. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so first of all, vague question. Could you both talk about like your path to acting as a career and how you realize that this is what you wanted to do? Um, mine started with watching a lot of movies as I grew up in a very rural place that was snowed in a good part of the year. So uh, I've been watching films for a long, long time. I think I've been <clears throat> quoted before multiple times and it's very true. Um, the first time I realized that acting was an option was uh, when I really wanted to grow up to be an Ewok. Um, Loved that life, was all about it, um, but was also old enough to realize that it's fantasy. So if I wanted that life, I could become an actor and then I could go live that life. <laughs> and not much has changed. <laughs> um, I was grateful enough to just have a family and a small community that, um, you know, they really want their kids to do well. And, um, it's also a culture built around um, seeing people's potential and either teasing them away from stuff, their egos telling them they're good at into stuff that they're actually good at. And um, I've always just been flat out uh, encouraged in the performance, um, not by just my wonderful, gracious, amazing parents, but really whole, whole small town. Um, and I decided to pursue it in college. My mom is a college professor and she kind of pre-advised me when I was trying to pick a major. Um, I was for a bit thinking water biology, for a bit thinking linguistics, um, but she said, you know, your first four years are, are tough. Um, and there are very few people who go on to do what they get their degree for. So just do what you want to do, do what's going to carry you through school, what you're going to love, and you'll find it within that. Um, she was right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And then just miraculously have 
been booking work since right before I graduated. So, um, yeah, it keeps coming back around every time I think I'm done with it, it comes back around. Yeah, I'd say I was in a, a very um, similar boat with Lily's in terms of like being really thankful for the supportive family. Uh, like the whole reason I got into acting and filmmaking was uh, my dad, when I was about four years old, he had a, um, a little Sony Hi8 camera on loan from his brother-in-law. And so he was bored, my mom was gone and he decided he was gonna make The Wizard of Oz. And so he did and I played every single part in the movie. And he played this back for me to see like right after we shot this. And I was just like entranced, like, wow, we just did that. But like he was able to bottle that, capture that and then put it back for me to see. So that put the bug in me. So thanks dad for that. Um, and so that once I knew I could do that, I couldn't stop. And so it just became kind of an addiction. So like growing up, I was a kid who was always just making movies with his friends, uh, made a lot of horror movies, was obsessed with horror movies. I wanted to be a horror film director. And, um, and then I got into high school theater and I realized, oh, wow, now I have all these props and all these students to build a company for my film. So I would do plays during the school year. And then like on the weekends and the holidays, like that same group of friends that I would take and we'd make movies. Um, and so I would try to balance like getting to work with some of the friends that I loved getting to do an original piece on stage and then trying to do something that uh, took it to a new level, like with a camera. And so I think that was kind of my training ground for seeing also the difference between like how can you tell this story or how can you get this idea across on stage whether it's in the round or proscenium and then how can you also do that with a movie um so my parents were like look we know you love films they were always really supportive of me making films but when it came time for college they were like well uh kind of similar to lily they were like we know that you can do this no matter what and you should focus on doing what you love to do um, it just so happened that I also just really love literature. And so I got my degree in English lit and film, uh, UTA, UT Arlington. Um, and then met a lot of friends during college, just making movies. And that just persisted. Some of those friends I made in college, the same friends that I collaborate with today. Um, and just kind of kept going from there, just like kind of doing indie films and then just keeping working. Yeah. Um you both have worked in in film and theater uh so i'm wondering what for you is sort of the difference between approaching those two different mediums as an actor and also like how has acting in each medium affected your approach to the other medium sorry just saying hi to jocelyn, hey, you know, jocelyn. <laughs> um yeah that's uh my background and foundation is in theater and I've always been an actor that initially, especially in the, the rehearsal process, um, I do tend to get fairly insular. Um, mm. It's not always the easiest thing for me to make the strongest, boldest choice first. And I'd been told pretty consistently that I'm suited for black box, small house stuff, um, but have many times needed to perform for large audiences and very large scope characters um, and very, uh, I mean, for example, I got my equity card or most of my points for um, my equity cards playing um, a 94 year old morphine addict <laughs> in, in um, large or small, um, theaters, opera houses, uh, arenas. This was with, with Montana Repertory Theater and it was a tour of To Kill a Mockingbird. So um, yeah, the, uh, the foundation in theater has just, that I continue to rely on is very much based in physical work because I tend to already be somebody who gets so in my own head with analysis of things. Um, 
it's the best practice to just make that a somatic practice rather than like an intellectual one. So I really, really ground in um, Meyer hold biomechanics and um, I tend to lean back on animal study when I'm building a character. Um, and one thing that I feel I feel really was great about going to the University of Montana and this was just like happenstance is um, the media arts program was growing and very new while I was there. So I still collaborate with some of the filmmakers that came out of that program because they would come see plays and um, I didn't I didn't really orient my auditions or my desire for the big proscenium stage. I really liked the small multimedia or multi-form black box theater. So the first thing that I was seen for or uh, cast in was a multimedia piece that um, it was a it was a deconstruction and a reconstruction basically of Miss Julie. Um, I think Strindberg, I, I can't remember now, but um, I was playing Kristen the cook and her whole thing um, was very much about repression. So it was this nice blend of having this space to fill with my body and to find a lyrical sort of movement to indicate what was going on in this woman's head. But then having superimposed in the scenes, these very close tight shots to also inform what was going on with that character and people either loved it or hated it <laughs> but um it was a really really wonderful way for me to fuse the um the outwardness that um that that theater asks for but also the the internal process that the camera picks up so um yeah, since, since that play and uh, other students having seen it, um, I, I particularly worked well on camera. Um, I've got to know what it is about the structure of my face or just uh, that I'm kind of a cartoon toony person anyway, so tiny gestures really go a long way. Um, but people wanted to work with me and it ended up being that I was doing far more short film work for students in this burgeoning growing media arts program than I was ever doing theater. Um, and now it's, uh, for the last few years, it's kind of been a play a year and a few films a year. And it's about the same ratio as it was in undergrad. Um, so we were talking a little bit in the beforehand about theater, specifically Beckett. And that's a, that's, that's a good example of um, how outwardly and performatively you can change the space and you can really influence the audience's sense of time. And Beckett is one of the only writers in theater I feel accomplishes that the same way that a filmmaker is able to. Um, so... Yeah, uh, the two the two still prop each other up. Um, the theatrical language doesn't always carry over to working with a film director, but the basic sort of like somatic method in <laughs> to finding a character and not just finding, but sustaining a character. Um, especially when you're shooting in a non-linear fashion where you're breaking down the character arc and you don't get to, you don't get that build like you do on stage. You don't get to sustain that energy with other actors. Um, it's really, really helpful to create the physical life of the character, let the emotional life and the, uh, the thoughts happen organically in the moment and then just kind of scale how, um, how big or small you take it. So, Frank's turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny you brought up really the uh, <clears throat> saying that you felt more suited or you felt more connected to like a black box setting because even when I was doing uh, high school theater, I remember the first couple of years, my theater teachers were basically like, 
I think you're, you'd be better suited for film than theater. Because some of the things that we're not seeing at all from the back looks like you're doing nothing. And then when we sit on the front row, we're like, okay, Frank's trying something out. We just can't see it. Um, <laughs> I think maybe that's also kind of during those high school years got me into making films to kind of explore that kind of duality between film and theater. I actually haven't done but one play since high school and uh, as an adult, and it was um, an original work, which was really exciting, which is why I said yes. And it was by a friend of mine, Stephen Walters in Dallas. And it was about John Wilkes Booth. And uh, I played uh, Booth's older brother, Edwin. Um, and it was something I didn't know that I'd missed necessarily. Like I, I still would talk about my love for theater or read plays, but I think I'd been going through a series of a couple of mediocre to rough experiences on some indie films. And so when I got this invite to do this play, I thought, okay, here's a way to, to get the fire back in a way. And it did that. Um, Cause as Lily was saying, it's like you, it's a different thing. You have that immediate connection with the audience that's there and there's an energy in the air that's very different. And you get to fulfill that arc and feel and feel that arc over a single day or single night, which, you know, you know, I have little note cards I draw out or little notes I have for doing a film where it's like, man, I hope that this card certainly fits within this moment of this arc of this character in a movie because we're shooting it so out of order. So I was glad I did that play, but, and it left just more hunger in me to do theater. Lily and I were just talking earlier about how be great maybe sometime to do a play together because I've been itching to do that. Um, so even though I haven't done a lot of theater really since high school, except for that one play, I think about theater a lot. I read plays a lot. And even in high school, when I would like do some student directed plays, I actually, with my friend Adam Whittington, we adapted Dr. Strangelove into a play in this very like <laughs> Max Fisher Rushmore way where I like, lights going off and people running up down the aisle. It was a very, it was, it was an <laughs> epic production. So I think even then I was like, I couldn't just do picnic. I couldn't just do Beckett play. Like I had to do uh, Dr. Strangelove. I had to think, how can I take a movie and put it in play? And then thinking, how could I do a play and make it into a film? So I think that's the way my mind was always working um, growing up. And so when Lily brought up multimedia, that's something that I've always been fascinated with is how to blur those lines of, of participation from an audience um, has always been something I've been into. And I think that's why I, I started getting more heavily into even directing video installations um, as I got a little older and started making films and realizing, okay, I could have these loop pieces and these galleries that could take the person on a journey through a space in a gallery and they could see several different video channels and it could transform their idea of what the narrative is just based on the order in which they walk around the space. So those interactive natures, whether it's film, theater, a hybrid, anything hybrid is something that I'm, I'm just really fascinated by. Um, well, since you've both worked together a couple times, could you speak to sort of the difference between the prep process when it's more solitary versus when you have another actor that you've got relationship with to to bounce ideas off of. Yeah, um, one thing that's kind of nice about both of our solitary process possibly is the films <clears throat> that are kind of, I don't know, Frank, it seems like you're expressing that um, that uh, Sal, is that your character's name? Yeah, this film yeah. I did called Some Beasts and it's all set yeah. on a farm and I play this farm. Yeah, and both characters, like you, you, you're, grounded with them initially watching them do these this work process um <clears throat> which actually is not unrelated to what i was saying earlier about my whole biomechanics is you get the gesture in and then the character comes a lot from the gesture and then it's scaling the gesture so you see um you just see echoes of the same sort of um physical language throughout and i saw so many and what was funny is his film came out the month that certain women wrapped so the two never influenced each other 
but if you were to watch them together, it looks in some ways a bit like a male articulation of that character in that it's an examination of this romanticized Thoreau. Um, like, you know, simplicity, living off the land, um, but then also the reality of what that means. And then Kelly is just, she's such, she's so not a romantic person. So, um, I mean, she's very loving, but you know what I mean by romantic? <laughs> because we've seen Kelly's films. Um, Rancher didn't have any anything she was looking for in her isolation. The isolation was kind of the source of that. So I don't know, with my process with playing an isolated character and then having a little bit more of a, of a propensity to be an insulated, um, you know, they always say, you know, act from the outside in instead of the inside out. But I think it can be both. Um, it was definitely, definitely a process of spending a lot of time with Miley Malloy's text, um, Travis B, the short story that it was based on. And like any literature, and I've done a lot of adaptations of literature of Montana writers. And there's some, um, you know, possibly just this shared sense of what it is to be on that land and in a culture where there is a lot of, um, you know, just a lot of work, um, a lot of quiet solo sort of work, but also just, um, you know, in the summers, really boisterous, excited communities coming together because you spend so much of your time isolated and separated from one another. So that was a, that was a lot of, um, of my own work, finding the rancher was recognizing what was familiar in Miley's text. Um, that's place and culture based, but also individually. Um, there were things I perceived about the character that you find your substitutions for. Um, so you can either lean into them or get them out of the way, um, trying to understand what in that character is reminiscent of yourself. Um, and it was, it was really, really amazing having that framework because Miley just writes for actors. Um, her work is so, so gestural, like she writes in, there's one moment and it didn't, um, it didn't necessarily this specific beat make it into Kelly's adaptation, but Kelly would write in Miley's tiny little textures to show you who this character was. Um, but one that you can see in certain women that I recall and I recalled it from Miley's text and it's possible it was in the script too, but sitting there um, pulling up to the school with the cars in the parking lot. And um, it just said Chet uh, pulled at a loose string on the steering wheel. And it didn't say Chet pondered whether or not to go in or Chet, uh, you know, wrestled with their sense of self-worth <laughs> or whatever, you know, just, Chet sat quietly and pulled on this loose string on the steering wheel, which is just such, so close to the process that I have in finding and creating those characters. What are the tiny things they say? What are the little gestures that they, they have naturally? Um, and then, um, what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess, how does the process differ when you're working by yourself versus when you have gotcha. a close collaborator? Well, that's, um, that's also part of it because you do a lot of your own prep work beforehand. So I'd sketched out a lot of my assumptions about the character, but then as soon as Kelly and I got together, it took us about a week to settle into each other's language and to get on the same page. Um, so that's uh, that's one reason why I feel it's so important with the theater training program I went through and just constantly being told, get out of your own head. Because um, if you walk in with preconception, then you already have made choices about where the scene's going and nothing, none of the work is gonna be authentic that comes from that. It's the same for theater, it's the same for film. Um, <clears throat> but filmmakers like Kelly really, really want you to come in knowing who this person is so it's um it's I guess it's a lot like maybe you know Frank you can speak to this speak to this too but the writing process when 
you um, have to kill your darlings along the way because when you finally do get it to a reading stage, when you do have other, just other um, springboards or other, you know, some people mirror what you're asking for, some people resist it. It's just, it helps tune it and pop it out into a more spherical um, feeling, or I guess well-rounded feeling project. So yeah, you, I do a lot of the insulated individual work, but then you just have to be willing to let that shit go <laughs> when you get face to face with another person and you can collaborate together and find it as it's happening. Um, Frank and I, we met basically landing at the same airport at about the same time and then commuting together to set. And we had a three, four hour drive on the way there to do so. The so, <clears throat> yeah, and that was all about sharing what were our initial thoughts about the character, who is this person, and then just getting to know each other as Frank and Lily, but then also finding Josh and Mara, um, like, what do they do together? Um, okay. And we found a lot that just in the conversation that we had in that car, speaking, all right, this is who I'm basing this character on, or this is a time in, like, I don't know. Um, this is a time in my life where maybe this is coming from. It just, it was just in talking about our characters, um, and where they came in from us, came from us as individuals, just gave us a whole foundation for our friendship. And the people that we play in that film have a very different relationship than Frank and I do. Um, it was, it was a, it was a camaraderie that we found is you find camaraderie when you're working and doing manual labor with somebody else. But actually that's kind of cool, Frank. It just occurred to me that you and I both played kind of lonely, isolated ranch hands and then came together as farm workers. Why has that never clicked before? <laughs> um, so you talk for a little bit. <laughs> uh, I think what you said is so fun. like getting to, getting to become friends with Lily, like get to know where we were at that point in our lives, opened it up for us to, to talk about what each of us was already thinking about these characters that in Freelance case, there was a lot of growth that happened on set. It came together fairly quickly for Lily and I to be involved. Um, and so then we were, you know, kind of creating these characters with the team. There was a lot of improvisation and mm -hmm. uh, the filmmakers, Kate McLean and Mario Ferloni, they come from a documentary background. So they have a, a very wonderful observational approach to things where they just wanna watch the plant grow. And so it's like, you're the plant, you gotta give them all stages of that growth. And then they may be able to pick out that stage or that stage of the growth they like, or maybe they wanna get rid of the whole plant and bring in another plant. And I think to Lily's comment, that's the thing that I, I feel like I've learned the most or really been trying to enact like with my work is like prepare, 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 and then be willing to throw it all out the window. Yeah. And then it's okay to throw it out the window um, because it was the process. A lot of times like, it'll be better. Exactly. <laughs> and it was somebody the process. Else's voice in there. Yeah. And it was like the process of, of growing, which is why you're able to, to throw it out. It's like the, uh, with the mandala that they put together piece by piece and then they destroy it as soon as they finish it. And so I feel like as soon as I did all this prep work, it's like, throw it out. Like it's going to be in a bar now instead of a car you're seeing and you're smoking, you're no longer having lasagna or whatever it is. Um, so but all of that, I'm sorry, I interrupted. Oh, no, go ahead. All of that work that you and I did um, in the car together on set, finding what these two that probably have been to a number of shows together and like gotten wasted together yeah. and like had either words or exchanged yeah. fists at one point. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, anybody who's intensity. Yeah. Anybody, anybody who knows that kind of scene understands what that, you know, how you, how you're friends with somebody that you can just also just throw down with and be fine exactly. the next day. Exactly. Um, but yeah, none of that, none of that relationship that you and I found and was very, very visceral between us made it into the narrative, but you can see it really, really clearly 
in just that one interaction where we're waiting to be paid and you know you're you're doing your josh stalking and like you know whatever and just like and then you just for a second like you going out tonight and then just the reaction i had to that I, like when i watched it later it's like okay Frank and I do not have that kind of rapport or relationship, yeah. but that felt yeah. so clean to me. Mm -hmm. And um, it was one of the moments that I liked, um, one of those tiny little exchanges that I really, really savored watching later. Yeah. That came I, from <laughs> that, you know, it's the iceberg thing. It's like you see this much of it, but then that much work all underwater. Is done. Huge iceberg. Yeah. That's, and that, and I wonder sometimes too, like being so close to the material when you're in it you know, we know what was shot, we know what was there. And then, so it's so interesting to have other people then see a film and be like, well, maybe that moment didn't make the cut, but did that feeling come out in another scene? And Lily and I just this morning on the phone, were talking about with some beasts for me and certain women for her, you know, those two films were both these, you know, uh, ranchers and farmers, these people who are working on the land and, you know, there's only, you know, 2% of, of all the material that was actually shot because it was such a lived in experience. And to kind of go to your question about like prepping or process, like I think the more prep and rehearsal I can do, the I, for me, the work's just going to be better. And it doesn't mean that I can't just drop into something without knowing it. And it doesn't mean I'll drown. I mean, you have to rise to the occasion, but I feel like for me, it shows like in the work that, okay, yeah, if I can just be in a space, I was lucky with some beasts that I got to work on this farm, get to know these other non-actors who were farmers and build a trust and get to actually work the land so that I knew what I was doing. At least I didn't look like a total novice, you know, uh, to be as authentic as possible and to respectfully, you know, represent these farmers that have been farming there for a long time in Virginia where we shot it. And so, uh, and I think because there was that trust there with the director, Cameron Nelson, he was also very, we could get very specific and be like, let's direct this in a matter of what Sal's breath like in this moment, or like how does Sal walk in this moment? And then the role was so taciturn of a part. It's like, everything was physicality. And I used to always say that I worked from the outside in I don't know if that's necessarily the case I think they happen simultaneously for me especially yeah. when you read a script but I will say there's been certain specific roles where it's like something's missing until I put on those boots or something's missing until I literally get dirt under my fingernails in the scene yeah. and then all of a sudden okay okay now I know who that person is you know yeah it's how you can smell the shit on your shoes it's yeah like <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's totally true. I mean, that was, and so for me, it's like, I don't know what comes first, the chicken or the egg, the external, the internal. I think it's like when, for me, at least you're reading the script, you're getting all these ideas, you're getting all these things, exactly. And they're forming into one. And then you may figure out like what's closest to you or more removed from you in that physicality or inter internal aspect to bring out. And so like for some beasts, I'm, I'm, um, I have my bouts where I like to talk, but I, I consider myself a fairly quiet person. And um, I feel like that was something where like, that was closer to me to, to feel comfortable with, was, was just tapping into the silence of the character. But then doing the next film where it's like, you have a chatterbox character, like, wow, like this is a totally good thing, you know? So. You end up picking up and osmoting a lot. I don't know if osmoting is the right word, but you um, you end up blurring and melding with whatever environment it is you're working in. <clears throat> and I find it takes a few days for that to kind of find its own equilibrium. And then um, it's like, it's informed and to a degree, it's definitely organic from your own response to what the environment is. But it's... Um, I mean, just being around those ranch hands, being around those real people that then you emulate. And um, I don't know, Frank and I were talking a little bit about this idea of emulation with a character before the call. And um, for me, that doesn't always feel natural if it's contrived or if I'm trying to do it. A lot of times you just start soaking in the rhythm that another person has, the pace that they have. And whether it's intentional or subconscious, um, nobody's really an island 
in these collaborations. Um, and that's okay. I mean, it's, it's such a thing for artists to want to be the individual voice, to be the refined, like brandable person, but it's the reality is the projects and the work is a fusion and a centering of everybody. Um, I find mm -hmm. when, when that equilibrium works itself out, and everybody kind of settles into the push and pulls and then you know when you need to be when you need to be fluid and when you need to be fixed um and then once you find that language together then just magic happens yeah and um, same, go ahead oh, sorry thank no, god are we at are we at 15 no no it's fine uh i was gonna say and to that point not only with non-actors and keeping each other on our toes. But Lily and I were talking earlier about playing farmers and ranchers about working with animals because Lily said so aptly, like animals never lie on camera. Yep. So like, you know, you, you know, if you're working with an animal, they're gonna speak the truth that they're comfortable with you. You have a history with them, like it's gonna show. Um, yep. Just getting to spend that time. And I would add that it also reminds us in our work that we're all animals too. <laughs> Yeah, like that's one reason I like the animal study is um, it removes it from trying to emulate and copy like another person because that just feels really invasive to me. If it happens, it's usually a subconscious thing or I try to at least make it an agreed upon thing. Animals, like you, you just pick up a different rhythm from pure observation of them. And of course, like we try not to anthropomorphize, but we always do, especially in the arts. Um, but I find that really, really effective in getting into that, you know, that Alexander or that Meyerhold sort of like physically based thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this, this is an assertion I'm making on my own, but just owning that we are animals. <laughs> owning that we have these instincts that we don't even understand. Um, we have impulses that we don't always process or are even self-aware of, but that's what sings when it happens in the lens. It's like Kelly jokes, um, Michelle would tease her about uh, just like, oh, you'll, oh, of course you were watching the animal and not performance, which is true. <laughs> and um, I mean, Kelly, while we were working, had to have either her DP or her AD call a shot because she said, I will never call cut on an animal. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. So, and we're, we're squishy little animal beasts ourselves mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Should never forget that. No. You had both then telling me before that uh, your experiences as like teachers has impacted your work as actors a lot. Could you talk to that? Yeah, um, a little bit about that, uh, just on the same note of finding the collaborative space. Um, the best teachers don't teach, they lead you to the threshold of your own understanding, well which I feel is also this place that artists when the work is really good are able to find with each other you show up and you own what's yours you know what's yours um you have a common goal in mind which is the execution of or the learning of or whatever it is you both want the same thing and then how do you get there um so like my my teaching has been pretty much within the realm of applying theatrical um, techniques to, to pedagogy, whether it be science or language or whatever. So much of it is about activating the, the individual um, and bringing them into the circle where they can be expressive, where they can share, where they can contribute, or you know, learning how to see the whole and are you a more analytical type or, um, you know, it's, one thing that I do tend to notice is my acting is always stronger when I'm engaging that teacher self um, because it keeps me, it keeps me engaged. Um, it keeps me balanced with, uh, with communication and then expression. 
Yeah, I'd say, so I, I have a background with um, teaching public school with um, elementary kids from like kindergarten to sixth grade. And I think we're talking about how, you know, animals don't lie and, and, and kind of the truth and, you know, the phrase, you know, from the mouths of babes and that kind of thing. But I, I think there's a, when you're, when you're teaching and you're expressing ideas, you're always relearning every day how to communicate with someone. And so that can affect then not only how you communicate with your fellow cast and crew on a film, but how you're going to communicate as that character in that story, in that film. Um, and every day that I would go into teach, like you may have an idea of how this class is going to work, but no class is the same as the other class of kids that you have. It's much like a movie. You can't apply the same, I don't think, at least for me personally, you can't apply the same framework yeah. movie by movie in the same way. Uh, it's a different process every time, you know, and um, some may need a lot of rehearsal. Some may thrive without any rehearsal, whatever is the case. When I was in college, I taught um, basically these high school kids that they were either having behavioral issues in class uh, by either with treat withdrawing too much to a point where they were trying to figure out ways to get them to open up or they were becoming very aggressive. And so the school had this idea of like, well, why don't we uh, pair them off with different theater instructors. And so I came in, so I was in college and I basically worked with these kids and would use speech tactics and, and, uh, and the theater to get them to use monologues to open up and to find their vulnerability. And some of the kids that came out of their shell, I mean, basically I'm directing, you're directing these kids, but then you're also you're, you're getting them comfortable in a space where they can tap into a part of themselves that was either sheltered or told was not right or told was wrong, that they should never do it again, whatever is the case. And then they could get that out. And, and ultimately, when I think about that, I think about that's one of the reasons why I like acting is that you get to, you get to expel this energy. You get to explore parts of your psyche maybe you didn't even experience or know about or haven't had before and you get to tap into something else and you get a side of yourself that you didn't get to see um i know there's a, a way of thinking that's like every not everybody's right for every part but everybody can play every part it just would be their own take on a role and right. what aspect of that part would be highlighted more than other aspects um so it's uh it's, it's really interesting to kind of delve and probe like that so i think teaching taught me not only how to articulate better, but also how to listen better at the same time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, Lily said something really interesting before we start the live stream about how um, when you were working with Kristen Stewart and certain women, her performance was very different in shots where, and when scenes yeah. where she, when the camera was on you, and you were taking the scene from your angle and when the camera was her on her. So could you speak to the difference between acting for another actor to, in regards like versus acting for the camera? Yeah. Um, well, Kristen has a very like natural director in her and she has, she's got the approach in working as I remember working with her. Um, it felt the same where you, neither of us were driving the scene. We were meeting each other at a middle ground and it was so generous and so mutually supportive. And Kristen and I both had our own relationships with Kelly and our own way of communicating with Kelly. So to deliver what was needed in the lens, um, it, was, it was a bit like watching this scaling of gesture where when it was my coverage, Kristen was much more expressive, was much more like drawn about it because it was giving me specific things to react to almost more strongly. Um, and then I'm not sure what her conversation would have been with Kelly, but I mean, that that's one thing that was so lovely about working with her is when it was one another's coverage because we were both making the same film and we both were like wanting it to be 
everything it could. She gave everything when it was mine and I gave everything I could when it was hers. And what the camera picked up was, you can tell when the camera's on, especially the style that Kelly works in and the style that we were both working with. Um, the extra version turned up when the camera wasn't on us. And then when it flipped, then, then the insulation happened, then the internal thought, the, uh, all the moments of not really making eye contact or just like having like lingering staring eye contact, those became very clear. Um, so yeah, it was, it's interesting seeing, um, how effective that can be, especially when you're, when you're crafting a scene where both characters are kind of on different tracks and it's really clear that it looks like they both understand the agreed upon circumstances of the scene or are just feeling their way through it. Um, and then seeing how, how crafted and supportive and just deeply intuitive that process was of one another's space. Um, yeah. Yeah, Kristen is Kristen is very, very deft at that. And um, working with Frank is we found a similar process with with Freeland because so much of it was us creating these characters individually kind of in our little silos and then having them get to know each other and like then developing that organic relationship that those characters had, but then also finding our language together as creatives. And Frank being somebody who's so natural at just facilitating and helping that voice helping with draw helping draw that voice out i'd created a character that was already very very locked in to um just you know she was she had a um she had her own shit going on she was building a whole program at evergreen state college which is you know you you build your own curriculum when you go there so you have to really 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 know what you want to do and what you want to study but then being somebody who didn't want to share that with uh, this sure. motherfucker over here because yeah. <laughs> it's so it's personal. Yeah. yeah, so that's that's what we found was um, Frank was so great at pulling out thoughts and moments from a character I'd created that was so resistant to sharing anything, um, which I think is probably very much related to the work that you've done as a teacher. Yeah. Um, and then kind of vice, vice versa, I hope. I mean, I wonder if that was like for you. No, I mean, absolutely. And I mean, uh, for our role specifically in Freeland, we're just these two characters who are orbiting each other in very opposite ways. Uh, and, you know, my, my character always has to hold court in that film. And he always has to have the last word. He always, he'll, he mansplains constantly and he's, you know, at, for him, you know, there's something off when he goes quiet and that's when you're like, okay, like what's, what's happening here? Like what's about to happen? So Lily was really great. I mean, just in all of our scenes together, which we had a, we had a handful of scenes where there was like a lot of group settings, but not a lot of scenes where it was just like the two of us. Um, but even in the group scenes, I think we found ways to, and our other friend, Cameron Matthews, who's in the scene with us, we kind of played the three harvest workers in Freeland. And I feel like we all found ways to make each other listen, push, pull when need be. Um, we're a trio of very different personalities. And I think it's, it's good thinking that we already were on the right track for thinking the ways we were going to be. And then we're able just to finesse it once we got to set because we didn't have a lot of time either prep. And we all just kind of showed up and jumped into shooting. I think we right. started, went to like trimming, like as soon as we arrived almost. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, get get that gesture in your body. Get comfortable yeah, exactly. with it. You're ready Look to like go. you know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's too bad we didn't have Cameron in the car with us too. But he lived close; he could drive himself. Yeah. Hey well, Cam. Hey Cam, wherever you are. Hey Cam, <laughs> we love you. Casa Limon. Yeah. Um, Casa Limon I'm gonna pass to Alex now uh, for the questions from the audience. Um, so we have a question submitted um, on YouTube from uh, Kushalan. 
uh, which is um, how do you deal with the immense emotional and physical pressure of being actors? Um, can it not be extremely debilitating, especially early on? Yoga. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in one way, like taking care of your physical form because that is your instrument and finding a way to keep, uh, sorry to make this crass, but to keep your own head out of your own ass. <laughs> <laughs> As, um, this is such a this can be such a has the potential to be such a toxic thing um, but like anything it's about um, keeping your form healthy keeping your form out turned and relying on the people around you As I mean being an actor can feel really crippling and the worst part about it but really was nice during the, doing the whole press circuit for certain women and having um, having just these seasoned vets see how terrifying that was. Just like the, I mean, literally you're blinded by freaking lights and it can be very ungrounding, but then you just find a way to navigate that um, and find a way to live within that space and keep it about the work and keep it about each other. I mean, that's, uh, that's one of the things that is so wonderful about theater is it's you know it's a play and it needs a lot of players so just keep engaging with with others keep engaging with um you know not just other humans but like other everything stay stay open stay receptive and um one of the best pieces of acting advice i was ever given at university of montana um my first teacher, Jillian Campana, said that if you stay interested, you'll stay interesting. And the people that we watch on film that are the most interesting to watch are so focused and so invested in whatever it is they're looking at um, or processing or whatever. It's like you might call that objective. You might call it stakes. I just call it curiosity. Um and I think that's kind of what keeps it's kind of what keeps a lot of people, whatever your profession, whatever your track is, it's, it keeps you sane, keeps you healthy. I think. Yeah, I think it's one of the reasons when you were talking about theater earlier, uh, why I did that play in 2015 was that I, I was not interested with some of the things that I was doing and I wanted to be interested again, really, like to your point about that and so doing theater kind of put that fire back into me to then be interested I think for me it's like always trying to you know if we're fortunate to be able to to act at all but it's it's this um to have any opportunities but I feel like looking for certain opportunities that are for me different than the last one is what helps keep that interest going so even if I'm you know, mentally, physically exhausted from whatever role I just did. If I know that maybe something else soon or next or down the road can be very different and be a whole new world and a whole new character to explore, then I get interested again. And I just am ready for that next race. I think um, another thing is, is learning when to take off the coat when you finish the character. Yeah. And not taking certain things home with you. I think, um, you know, I, I played some characters that I was, I was ready to take off the coat. You know, I was like, this coat's been on too long and not even judging the character in any way, but just that it did take so much uh, out of you uh, that you needed a breath. And so I think being able to provide distance in that way, um, not only when you rap, but even just at the end of the day, just like being able to give time for yourself, as Lily said, just to be stay healthy, like keeping, maintaining, giving silence for yourself and time to relax, uh, read. Oftentimes I'll find that I like to, as much as I can, like at the end of like a work day, uh, read just to like, it's a way for me to enjoy another piece of art, like some literature, but to escape and you can still be on set. You're still in whatever location they've sent you to, to be in a movie, but it gives you a little outlet. 
Um, it also it's, gives you a framework because the world is so bleeding into itself all the time and stories give us the way that we process and understand the world. Right. And the more stories that you have, the stronger, you know, stronger your structure is. I mean, it's an analogy used a lot, with like, you know, Blackfeet, Plains Indians, but all of the lodge poles in a, in a lodge and a teepee. So they, they prop and support each other up and they all come from different directions. They all, they all hold each other together and the, like they make each other strong. And it's what I've been taught about stories too. Um, when you, the more, the more stories, the more you, you know, <laughs> Jefferson airplane feed your head. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The uh, yeah, just the more integrated you are as a human, I feel. Yeah. Um, so we had a question that was submitted about um, crying on cue um, and <laughs> whether that's uh, difficult and how directors sort of build the right environment to make that easier or, you know, I guess even more generally than just crying, but like for an emotional moment. Um, and do you have stories of ways a director helped you get into the right headspace when you were struggling? Um, one that comes to mind immediately was working with Sarah Dina Smith in Buster's Malheart in such a small um, time on screen, but it's such a pivotal turning point in the whole narrative. And Sarah has background as an actress herself. So there was, um, there was the crying that I was finding naturally just from the reaction of, you know, this distraught woman that I'm um, witnessing. And then there was the one where it's the insular playing over and over again, this grisly scene in my own head and kind of the, the shock of it. And then um, there was the texture Sarah came to and just made eye contact, <laughs> started breathing like that to get me on pace with her. And then that just was, that changed, that changed the kind of crying it was. Um, so Sarah had a very, very quick end to that because she has an acting background and could get there with me very, very quickly. Um, otherwise for me, it's just a, when it's there, it's there when it's not, eh, it, it gets there. <laughs> it's, um, it's been, it's about finding space and like anybody's learns in an acting program, accepting the given circumstances because if the given circumstances are tragic, then you're gonna fucking cry. <laughs> it's just, yeah. that be available to it. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I used to have this joke with my friend that uh, I could cry in the movie when it was a scene where I'm not supposed to be crying, but then when I'm supposed to be crying, it's like harder to some, somehow get there. Um, because it happens so organically, like in another scene where just like your emotions that you have built up suddenly kind of bubble over, but there's been only one or two instances, I think, in a movie um, where I like the scene revolved kind of around me crying like that was like inherent to the scene that like, wasn't an option. It was like and it had to be at a certain level, too. Um, and for that, for me, um, it's it's for me, isolation works with that. Like I have to isolate myself before I go in and do the scene. Uh, I'm usually able to like talk, you know, with other cast or crew casually, like usually before doing a take sometimes, but depending on the role, I like to self isolate just a little more, like for certain takes or certain scenes that uh, are really going to have to be emotive. Um, mm -hmm. And so isolation for me is really important. Once I get in that headspace, then just trying to sustain it and pace yourself because depending on the director and how they want to shoot it, how many angles and how many takes, you may have, you may be crying once in the movie, but you're crying 30 times if that's what they want. And, you know, we all, we have emotional reserves as actors, but we also, that means that it's not infinite. Um, yeah. And you can, you can tap it, but it's like you, you can't uh, take advantage of it. And so I think it's really important. Don't for frack group. for it. Yeah. All you directors out there, don't emotion. frack your actors. <laughs> yeah. That's the other pull quote for this event. Don't frack your actors. <laughs> uh, but I, I think it's really important then that for those, especially those scenes, that there's a communication with the director and the actor that, hey, this is how we're going to 
shoot this scene. This is when we really need it for this angle. And then if we get some extra, that's, that's bonus, that's extra cherries, but um, pacing yourself is so important. And, uh, yeah. and a lot of times you, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say for me too. It's like, I, I'm not, I don't subscribe to any one uh, methodology as like an actor. I kind of, I think of the way I act. I just think of grocery shopping. So I'll take books I've read about different methodologies and I'll pull from this or that if it works for this role or this film. So emotionally for some of those crying scenes, I'd say um, it can be sense memory or in another case, the scene as Lily said, might just inherently contextually be yeah. so devastating that you did, if you can just fall into that, you can let yourself go. Yeah, and sometimes you find in the lens that maybe crying isn't the strongest option. If it feels like it's a scene where the character needs to break down, maybe them not breaking down is a little more heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Like that's another, you know, on that note of don't frack your actors. It's like, don't get too wed to your own idea of what a breakdown for this character looks like, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, if they can get there, great. If they get there in a different way, it's, it may very well still be, incredibly interesting and it might say way more about the world you're creating than you anticipated oh the truth of it you know yes it can be totally opposite but it could have the same feeling at the end of the day yeah uh so one last question um peter rinaldi asks um when you guys were ta- talking about um how uh you know, it can take a, a, a few days or a week to get on the same wavelength as a, um, as a director um, or other actors. And if you're working on a film where there's not rehearsal time, um, what do you do? And is it like important to make time before filming to sort of melt minds? I think it can be very, 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 um, not can be, I think it is if you have the time to do it and you have a way of doing it, absolutely get on at least some of the same pages. But that's not to say that there's not a lot of magic that happens in just the surprise. So um, that's going back to the yes and thing. It's like you find it in the scene, you find it in the lens, but when you're on set, and this is maybe where it's a little different for film and theater, when you're on set, you're also responding to everybody that's there making this together. Not just It's not just an actors and directors game. It's not just for the actors, writers, directors, which can get a little bit like frenetic when <laughs> it's a full room of creatives together. Um, creatives, um, like there's any distinction, we're all creatives. But um, I find that my immediacy and my availability with those quick deliver projects kind of comes from being present with every single person from the time I set on set foot on set. So then it's just practiced. It's like, all right, I'm here with you 100% responding to what you're doing. Okay, now you here 100% responding with you and just like developing this with you. So you just kind of keep that hot potato in the air and then you boom, 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 go get it when you're finding it in the moment. Um, television works that way for sure. And um, it's always kind of surprising how, I mean, I, I, I don't even fully understand how it works, but how you, you can meet somebody and 30 seconds later just uh, have to show that you've been you've been married or that you've been, um, that you were childhood friends, you know, you've known each other since you were five. It's like, you don't have that time to build together. So it's just about, all right, now or never, it's you and me here in this moment. Um, So yeah, it's, I pick up that energy from just being present with every human on set. And hopefully it translates when you get on your feet in the lens. Not every actor is that way. So a lot of actors need to have their time and they need to have full focus on their character and then they'll find it when, um, you know, you're, you're let out into the, the open space to play with it and to let it breathe. Um, just personally, like I'll start eating myself from the inside out if I do that, but different methods. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I mean, every film is different in terms of, you know, 
maybe more if you're fortunate like i haven't done tv and i know just through stories from lily or through other friends who do tv it's like you know rehearsal wasn't really a thing you just you had your thing prepared you come and you do it um and that on a lot of indie films uh, the idea is that time is money they say and so they can't rehearse or if they do it's very brief or whatever is the case so for me even if you can't have rehearsal i think just having conversations as much as possible uh whether it's like one hangout time one car ride that's four hours um whatever it might be but just having one instance of that can do so much difference um mm -hmm. When I was in um, Upstream Color, my friend Carolyn King and I, we, we just met that day to be husband and wife. And we immediately just said, how much time do we have before we roll? Because they're about getting ready to roll. And they were like, well, we have like 20 minutes. Like, let's take a quick walk. And so then we just started going around the corner and just like telling each other stories and just trying to hear each other's voice um, and to be comfortable with each other and then to... Uh, to tap into the unsaid, I think. Um, and I think for me, even though like having that conversation is important, I do think that there's something to be said for, even if you can't rehearse, knowing kind of the other character that the other person you're hanging out with is going to bring. And that was the thing that Lily and I did in that car ride with Freeland is like knowing the kind of externality she was kind of planning to give me a heads up. And then even just like the mood of the character. And then I talked to her about mine. I was like, Hey, you know, my guy's not going to be a reserved stoic person. He's going to be a prodder. He's a, he's a extrovert. Instigator. Character. Instigator. He's a shithead. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was like, <laughs> once you know that it gives you that all you need to know is like, okay, you can give me any line you want. You can do whatever you want to do. But it's like, I know now who you are. I know what to expect. I know where it's coming from. And it can change everything, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and there's know, some actors that really need that. I mean, you get to know creatives on an individual level with the time that you have. Um, and, you know, it's just part of consent. It's part of respect is like, you kind of prepare the other person for any of the crazy curveballs that you might be throwing that they don't anticipate. But you at least establish that maybe that's there a bit. Yeah, and like you said, Frank, it's just you grab those moments. Um, like in Billions, uh, Jeffrey DeMunn, who plays my baby daddy turned husband, eventually, spoiler alert, but if you're not into the show yet, then whatever, it's been out for a year. <laughs> um, season five has been out for all, half a year. No, a few months, Never mind. Anyway, um, Jeffrey and I found just, just on the walk, the two block walk to set from hair and makeup to where we would be filming. It's like, all right, so how did we meet? Um, you know, and then we found what our natural sort of um, like flirtation would be, what our, what our natural chemistry is, as people were, and then uh, shared, you know, shared assumptions about my own character his is very well established in the series mine big old question mark um and then when we got to got to set we tried it four or five completely different ways that told four or five completely different stories and it was a surprise when the episode came out to see oh okay that's the track that they're going with okay that's another part of it yeah just condensing and being very open and being willing to get to find that middle ground with somebody else very quickly it's a, it's a muscle like anything else uh, so one last quick question um andrew pope asks were there any performances you saw earlier in your careers that you found particularly inspirational or that made you think that's what i want to deliver anything and everything philip seymour hoffman ever did absolutely second that um, Kate Blanchett too, as a as a fifteen year old girl, like Kate Blanchett was queen, literally. <laughs> Elizabeth was um, was my introduction to her work. Oh, those yeah. two. <laughs> those are great, yeah. Philip Seymour Hoffman for sure. I feel like just all the all the character actors. I just. Uh, always just gravitated toward they were just the ones that 
you know, you'd see him in a company of actors, especially under a certain director, and they'd be in a different part every time. And it felt like a theater company or a group of friends, basically, like, let's make a film. And that was so inspiring to see. Um, I think also when I was younger, just uh, Dog Day Afternoon, Pacino was a big one for me, where I was, I saw that when I was like 19, that specific one. I mean, all these dudes, you always hear talk about Pacino and, this cliche, you know, the Godfather and all this, but something about like Dog Day Afternoon, just that was the one that I was like, there was a, an energy and ferocity to that and that really stuck with me. Okay, well, um, thank you both very much for joining us. Um, uh, if you wanna read more from Lily, um, she talked to us about working with uh, Kelly Reichart in our new ebook, Roads to Nowhere, which you can get at Reichart Book. Dot com. Um, it'll be out this week. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I already got my mug, by the way. Oh, really? Oh, really? I, ordered it. I haven't been go have it yet, but I can't oh, wait to yeah. have it. I ordered it. So. Um, <laughs> I'm by holding it up like this. <laughs> <laughs> we'll superimpose it on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, so you can get a, a, a Kelly Reichart mug at um, 7 row.com slash mugs. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and we'll be back uh, next week with uh, two directors, um, Darius Juk and Jasmine Mazafari, who um, are going to talk to us about making your first feature. Um, so tune in next Sunday at uh, 5 p.m. at Eastern Time, and we'll be announcing a bunch more um, events throughout July and August. So thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for... both so much. Thank you. Cool. See one. you. Bye. Oh. Oh, it's just a